In this video, we're going to take an overview of the digestive system. We'll take a look at what it does, how it works, and its different organs. But first, what is digestive system? The three main functions of the digestive system are digestion of food, absorption of nutrients from food, and elimination of solid food waste. Digestion is the process of breaking down food into components the body can absorb. It consists of two types of processes. These are mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion starts in the mouth with mastication and continues with churning and mixing actions in the stomach. Chewing and churning motions in the mouth and stomach are the only ones involved in this process. While in chemical digestion, it begins in our mouth with our saliva. The process continues in our stomach and is completed in our small intestine. The majority of it takes place in our small intestine. The process of digestion begins inside the mouth. It serves as the alimentary tracts and chins, then starts the digestion process by causing salivation and driving the alimentary bolus into the pharynx. But before we break down onto the process, we generally divide the oral cavity into two parts, the oral vestibule and the oral cavity proper. And the dividing line between the two parts are the teeth and the gums. Let us start with the upper lip and the lower lip. They both meet at the lateral ends at the oral angle or the labial commissure. Above the lips, we have two grooves on either side as you can see here, called the nasolabial sulcus. And in the middle, there is a depression called the filtrum. And under the lips is the mentholabial sulcus or the mentholabial fold. Here is the muscle called the obicularis oris that helps regulate the opening of your mouth and that opening is called the oral fissure. Looking at the inside of the cheeks, at the around region, you'll find the opening of the parotid duct or the stenson duct which is the major duct of the parotid gland. And around this opening, you'll find the papilla of the parotid duct. Each of the three salivary glands has its own duct. The major duct of the parotid gland is the Stenson's duct. The duct of the submaxillary gland is the Wharton's duct. And lastly, the ducts that can be seen in the sublingual gland are Bartolin and Rivinus duct. The teeth break down the food into smaller particles which are then mixed with the saliva in the mouth to form a slurry mass called bolus. Once we have completely chewed our food, the tongue which is a muscular structure that forms part of the floor of the oral cavity and part of the interior wall of the oropharynx pushes the food particles down to our pharynx. The pharynx is a funnel-shaped tube that is about 15 centimeters long and extends from the base of the skull to the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage, with the function of conducting food to the esophagus, particularly the oral pharynx and the laryngeal pharynx. The constructive circular muscles of its outer layer aid in peristalsis or periodic contractions to help with movement, while the longitudinal muscles of its inner layer aid in swallowing after which the food travels through a long muscular tube called the esophagus, also known as the food pipe. It serves as the passageway of food and water from the mouth to the stomach where the particles stay for approximately 4 hours. The food then now travels to the stomach which is a J-shaped organ whose primary function is the churning and breaking down of bolus into even smaller pieces and mixing it with gastric juices for further digestion, turning bolus into chyme. The stomach releases a lot of acids such as hydrochloric acid and enzymes which further break down the food particles so that these particles can be absorbed by our body. The stomach has two curvatures, namely the, the lesser curvature which forms the concave part of the stomach and is continuous with the right border of the esophagus. A sharp angulation called the angular incisure is located here, and it characterizes the connection between the body and the pylorus. And the greater curvature which forms the convex part of the stomach and is continuous with the left border of the esophagus. The stomach is further subdivided into five main parts. 
the cardio, which is the part located near the pericardial sac of the heart containing the cardiac sphincter and the cardiac orifice that receives the opening of the esophagus, the fundus, the body, and the pylorus, which is the distal part containing the pyloric sphincter and the pyloric orifice, which regulates the discharge of contents into the small intestine. The stomach has three smooth muscle layers, the outer longitudinal, the middle circular, and the inner oblique muscles. Once the food particles reach the small intestine, it breaks down the food and gets rid of unnecessary components. The small intestine has three parts. First is the duodenum. It is where absorption actually begins. In this part, a lot of juices from the pancreas and liver such as bile and pancreatic enzymes help break down the food particles. The duodenum is further subdivided into four parts. The first one is the superior part, followed by the descending part, then the transverse part, also known as the inferior or horizontal part, and lastly the ascending part. At the descending part, we can also see the presence of the major and minor duodenal papilla which serve as openings for the main and accessory ducts of the pancreas. The next part is the jejunum. This part primarily absorbs sugar, amino acids, and fatty acids. The last part is the ileum, where the food spends the most of its time because it is where most water and nutrients are being absorbed. Now, we're gonna talk about the glands of the small intestine, the Brunner's glands. These secrete an alkaline fluid containing mucin, which protects the mucosa from the acidic stomach contents entering the duodenum. Next, Peyer's glands. They form an important part of the immune system by monitoring intestinal bacteria populations and preventing the growth of pathogenic bacteria in the intestines. These glands are most numerous in the ileum. As mentioned, there are accessory organs that help in the breaking down of food, including the pancreas, which is an elongated retroperitoneal organ lying posterior to the stomach between the duodenum and the spleen. It acts as both an exocrine and endocrine gland that produces digestive enzymes and essential hormones to aid digestion. The exocrine gland is the one that secretes pancreatic juice, which contains enzymes that break down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. The exocrine pancreas consists of ducts and other important parts, namely the sphincter of Audi, also known as the hepatopancreatic sphincter. It is a muscle located at the junction of the bile and the pancreatic duct where they enter the duodenum and it functions to regulate the release of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum as well as prevent the reflux of duodenal content into the pancreatobiliary system. Next is the Wiersung duct. It is the main pancreatic duct which joins the pancreas to the common bile duct to supply pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Next is the Santorini duct. It is the accessory duct of the pancreas with one branch joining the pancreatic duct and the other opening into the duodenum at the lesser duodenal papilla. Next is the hepatopancreatic ampulla or the ampulla of water. It is the expanded chamber formed by the union of the bile duct and the main pancreatic duct. While the endocrine is the one that contains islets of Langerhans, which are responsible for producing and secreting hormones including glucagon and insulin directly into the bloodstream. Three of the four cell types that makes up the islets of Langerhans secretes vital hormones. These cells include the alpha cells. These are the ones that secretes the hormone glucagon which helps increase blood sugar levels when it gets too low. Next is the beta cells. It is the one that secretes the hormone insulin, which helps lower blood sugar levels when it gets too high. Last is the delta cells. It is the one that secretes the hormone somatostatin, which inhibits the release of numerous hormones in the body. These hormones help regulate appetite and blood sugar levels, among others. Here are the parts of the pancreas. 
first head, which is the widest part of the pancreas, found in the right side of the abdomen, nestled in the C-curve of the duodenum. Second is the body, which is the largest part of the pancreas located between the tail and neck. The tail, which is the part located at the left side of the abdomen in close proximity to the spleen. Next is the liver. It is a dark, reddish-brown organ that is known to be the largest internal organ and gland in the body. Its key functions include transporting and processing substances absorbed from the gastrointestinal system, eliminating toxins from the blood, storing glycogen, and secreting bile, a yellow-brown or green fluid that helps emulsify fat. The liver has four lobes, the right lobe, left lobe, quadrate lobe, and the caudate lobe. It also has two types of ligaments, the falciform ligament and the round ligament. Last is the gallbladder, which is a pear-shaped organ that stores, concentrates, and transports bile into the duodenum of the small intestine via the common bile duct to assist in the breaking down of fats for digestion. The gallbladder has its own ducts. First, the common hepatic duct is formed by the right and left hepatic duct, the cystic duct. It connects the neck of the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct, draining bile to and from the biliary tree. The common hepatic duct and cystic duct forms the common bile duct. After the food particles are broken down and absorbed by the small intestine, the nutrients will be transferred to our body through the blood. The remaining particles that are not absorbed by the small intestine will enter the first part of the large intestine called the cecum. After that, it will enter the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and finally the sigmoid colon. These parts contain semilunar folds which arise through muscle contractions. Here are the other parts of the large intestine. The right colic flexure, also called the hepatic flexure, left colic flexure, also known as the splenic flexure, hostra, tinea coli, paracolic sulci, vermiform appendix, and the ileocecal junction. There are three primary functions of the large intestine. Absorbing water and electrolytes, producing and absorbing vitamins, and forming feces or what we all call poop. Waste are mostly undigested food, bacteria, and other substances that are released by our intestines. The feces are stored in the lower end of the large intestine called the rectum, a small portion of the colon that has been dilated. It extends from the sigmoid colon and into the anal canal. Before defecation, stools pile up in the rectum after forming in the descending and sigmoid colon. It is also where stools are stored until a person is ready to have a bowel movement or release them. The final process in food processing, which we secrete the feces out of our body, is called elimination through our anus. In conclusion, the main functions of the digestive system are digestion, absorption, and elimination. There are two phases of the digestion process, and these are mechanical, which only takes place in our mouth and stomach, and chemical digestion, which takes place mostly in our small intestine. To summarize the process of digestion and elimination, first, Food processing begins in the mouth. The food is then swallowed and moved through the pharynx into the esophagus. Then food is mechanically and enzymatically digested in the stomach. Most enzymatic digestion takes place in the small intestine. Lastly, the large intestine then eliminates waste leading to the opening for the elimination of waste called the anus. Did you know that our large intestine produces antibodies that help us boost our immunity? So always remember to eat healthy, 
stay just healthy and live healthily. Thank you for listening.